Despite being a timeless gaming icon, I have to admit that I didn't care about Tetris in the slightest. Until one day, the almighty YouTube algorithm creased my feet with this video. A 1989 Tetris expert plays Tetris Effect for the first time. The entire video is wonderfully interesting and you should absolutely watch it if you haven't, but I was specifically intrigued by this part. Now, if you don't know what Tetris Effect is, that means a couple things. One, that means that you have missed out on seeing my favorite video game trailer of the past three years, which you should definitely check out after this video. Um, but basically... A Tetris game has one of the best trailers. Sure, I thought. But my curiosity was piqued. So I gave the trailer a watch anyway, and 2 minutes and 58 seconds later, I was... on the verge of tears. To this day, it's one of the most moving trailers I've ever seen. I was dead set on playing Tetris Effect as soon as I could, and a couple of months after the game's launch, I got to do just that. And as my eyes and ears were blessed with the game's dreamlike shapes and its beautiful soundtrack, my first thought was, wow, I am really bad at this game. And my second thought was, wow, Tetris's rotation system is kind of really broken. But it hasn't always been the case. I don't think it will come as a surprise to too many people that Tetris games don't always work under the exact same rules to keep things fresh. And I'm not just talking about huge gameplay changes like Tetris Battle Gaiden's Magic Spells or Tetris 99's Hordes of Murderous Players. Even the basic mechanics that some might take for granted haven't always been present. Many, but not all older versions of Tetris feature a much nastier randomizer, only let you see one piece in advance, don't let you hold pieces, don't let you drop pieces instantly, and don't show you where your pieces are going to land. Because different developers handled different versions of Tetris and there was no standardized way to create Tetris games, they all featured some slight differences regarding the rules and controls. For example, in Sega's arcade version of Tetris, there was only one rotation button, which rotated your pieces counterclockwise, but when Nintendo released its Game Boy version in 1989, they added a second rotation button, letting you rotate your pieces both ways. So back in the late 80s, if you were a Japanese player who got really good at Tetris on the arcade, and then moved on to the Game Boy version, a lot of your skills wouldn't carry over. The Tetris company, which owns and licenses Tetris did not like these kinds of differences. They wanted every single Tetris game to work under the same basic rules and controls. So in 1996, they came up with a solution. This is a Tetris guideline. It's essentially an instruction manual for how to make a Tetris game. Anyone who wants to make an official version of Tetris must adhere to the guideline. And the Tetris company will reject a game prototype if they don't think it's going to move the Tetris brand forward or make enough money. Since it's confidential and gets updated every year, we don't know the exact contents of its most recent iteration. But we can at least have an idea of what it looks like because the 2009 edition of the guideline was leaked in its entirety and it covers everything from what the default control should be to which colors the block should have to how your pieces are rotated. And this is what I want to focus on. If you're at least moderately familiar with Tetris, it may be easy to imagine how its rotation system works. You have a button to rotate a piece clockwise and another one to rotate it counterclockwise. And if there's any kind of obstacle in the way, your piece will not rotate. Simple. And that's how a lot of older Tetris games work until the Tetris company decided it also didn't like that. They wanted a rotation system that was more welcoming to new players, one that didn't prevent them from rotating a piece every time there was something in the way. So they created a new standardized version of the rotation system meant to be used in every guideline Tetris game. The Super Rotation System, or SRS for short. 
first implemented in Tetris Worlds. The SRS adds a whole bunch of new rules to decide whether a block can be rotated and where it should go if it can. Every block can land in one of five predetermined positions after a rotation. Every time the player attempts to rotate a block, the game checks if it's going to collide with an obstacle. If nothing is in the way, then great, rotate away. But if the rotation is impossible, then the game performs the same test for the second position. If that rotation is impossible, then the game performs the same test for the third position, and then the fourth, and then the fifth. The rotation will fail entirely if and only if all five tests fail. This aspect of the SRS is commonly referred to as a kick, and I suppose that's because it seems like the obstacles are kicking your blocks into place. While the SRS allows for more flexibility in how and when you can rotate your blocks, it comes with a lot of very bizarre quirks. Your blocks can now go in places that look completely unreachable and move in ways that seemingly make no sense. With the SRS in mind, it becomes much easier to explain how the sequence I showed at the beginning of this video is even possible. Let's break it down. The IP spawns facing north. We spin it clockwise to make it face east. Test 1 is performed and succeeds, nothing's in the way. After letting the piece fall for a second or two, we're presented with our first dilemma. Let's see what happens if we try to spin the piece clockwise. Test 1 is performed and fails. Test 2 is performed and also fails. So does test 3 and 4 and 5. All 5 tests have failed, no rotation. Now, let's see what happens if we try to spin the piece counterclockwise. Test 1 is performed, and fails. And 2, and 3, and 4. But 5? Now we're starting to go places. The piece is now facing north again. By now, I think you get the gist of it, so I'll speed things up a bit. We move the piece to the left. All 5 tests fail if we try to spin the piece counterclockwise, and test 4 succeeds if we try to spin clockwise. And finally, we are back to our first situation. All 5 tests fail if we spin clockwise, and test 5 succeeds if we try to spin counterclockwise. From there, all we have to do is repeat the same steps with one less rotation to make each time until the board is cleared. And like I said, this is far from the only example of the SRS's weirdness, and anyone even remotely familiar with high-level modern Tetris will know that I haven't addressed the elephant in the room. As the years rolled by, the SRS and the guideline added a ton of changes that ended up turning Tetris into a very different game, and at the center of it all lies one of Tetris's best-known moves. In older Tetris games, the most powerful move at your disposal was more often than not, well, the Tetris, which you can perform by clearing four lines at once with an eyepiece. Oh man, look how That's high so his high. field is! Oh, boom! Oh, Tetris for Joseph! And Tetris, Tetris, Tetris for, for Green Tea! tea. Oh my god! Until T-Spins entered the chat and things were never the same again, because T-Spins can be worth more points than Tetris's. The specifics change depending on which version of Tetris you're playing, but two conditions must usually be met to perform a T-spin. First, the last move you performed must be a rotation with a T-piece. The second condition is slightly more complex. Imagine your T-piece is in a 3x3 grid like this and that its corners are labeled A, B, C, and D. Sides A and B must be occupied. In addition, either side C or D or both must be occupied. Also, if the fifth rotation test is performed and succeeds, the rotation will be counted as a T-spin even if the second condition hasn't been met. This explanation was a bit technical, but in practice, it's not that complicated. Most T-spin setups look like this. It's a plus, with an extra space in one of the four corners and you spin your T-block into it. The end. 
After spending some time learning basic setups, I slowly started incorporating T-spins into my playstyle and at first it was pretty awkward. I tried to turn everything into a T-spin setup. Sometimes it would work, most of the time it didn't, and every time my playing field became an absolute mess. But after enough practice and enough game overs, I started realizing that it's unwise to force T-spins into your games and that you're better off playing in ways that make T-spin opportunities more likely to appear. That is when I began to change. I didn't need to turn everything into a T-spin setup anymore. Hell, I didn't even need to create the setups. I just started seeing chances all over the place while playing the game. In reality, all I was doing was spinning virtual blocks into virtual holes, but in my mind it felt like I had opened some kind of third eye. In a certain way, I will never be the same person again, because I can't unsee T-spin setups, and I can't unlearn how to play Tetris either. No matter how much time I spend away from the game, I've lost count of how many times I completely stopped playing for months, only to start shattering my personal bests left and right upon returning to the game. It happened again while recording footage for this very video. And it just keeps on getting crazier because I actually kind of lied. Viewers who paid careful attention throughout this video may have noticed that one of my statements sounded somewhat off. T-spins can be worth more points than Tetrises. That was not a mistake. I said that instead of are worth more points because there are actually six types of T-spins. The more lines you clear with your T-spin, the more points you earn. Zero lines is just a T-spin. One line is a T-spin single, two lines is a T-spin double, and three lines is a T-spin triple. There's also the mini T-spin, which is a slightly easier version of the T-spin that has more lenient requirements but doesn't score as many points, and the mini T-spin single, which is a mini T-spin that clears one line. So when I said that T-spins can be worth more points than Tetris's, what I meant was that T-spins can score anywhere from 100 points, which is as much as a single single line clear to 1600 points, which is twice as much as a Tetris, all while requiring you to clear less lines than a Tetris. T-spin triples look like a really sweet deal, until you see what it takes to pull one off. Yeah. A lot of guides start talking about bases and overhangs and crazy things like that which just confuses the hell out of me so here's my explanation instead. It's an F. And then you rotate your T-piece once to fit it in the top part and a second time to fit it in the bottom part. Bam. Just make sure you have enough space to slide in your T-piece and that this wall is NOT one block high, otherwise your block will get kicked to the wrong spot. You really shouldn't try to do too many T-spin triples anyway because if you don't know what you're doing, it'll leave your playing field in shambles and cause you to game over or lose the match. It's very much a high-risk, high-reward move. And yes, I know you can score even more points if you clear the entire board and that you can start massive combos with four wides, but let's not get into that. Regular T-spin doubles and occasional T-spin triples along with a lot of Tetrises are pretty much the extent of my modern Tetris skills. I think I'm fairly decent at modern Tetris, but I'm not even close to be a true master. Watch actual experts play and it'll look like a completely different game. Most experts play at unbelievably high speeds. The current world record for the 40 line speedrun is 14.915 seconds. That means placing more than 6 pieces per second. They print T spin after T spin after L spin. Oh, gee, I see that L spin triple. They find solutions to seemingly unescapable predicaments, they play Tetris 99 to the beat of the music and still manage to win. It's like the SRS has become second nature for them. 
nice. If classic Tetris tournaments where you are trying to get a higher score than your opponents can be compared to a methodical chess game. Who can you get it over well, that's that? That's gonna be tough! Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. Multiplayer matches of modern Tetris, where your opponent receives garbage lines every time you clear your own, can be compared to a Dragon Ball Z fight, where everything can end in the blink of an eye. I actually make it a pretty healthy combo here. Oh! Yeah. You can learn a variety of openings and setups and strategies to make as many T-spins and sometimes even perfect clears as fast as possible, letting you rain hell on your enemies with T-spin death towers. And a lot of them have insane names that I love so, so much. Names like DT Cannon, Coon Dragon, Cut Copy, Doom Rank, Godspin, Grim Grotto, Imperial Cross, King Crim, Mochi Zanger, Special Triple Triple, and last but not least, Triple Donation, Double Attack. And if none of what I've shown you has convinced you that this rotation system is absolutely bonkers, here is one more oddity for you. Jaystris is a ridiculously customizable version of Tetris that you can play right in your browser, and it features a bunch of user-created maps that players are meant to clear as fast as possible. And one of them is an elevator. You can make an elevator in Tetris. And all this insanity comes from the simple action of rotating blocks. There are a lot of arguments to be made against the SRS about how the pieces given to you aren't completely random anymore, about how the kick table is unintuitive, about how early SRS games literally let you spin pieces forever, and I really do mean forever. But I still feel like the SRS has its place in this world. It's freestyle Tetris. You can just start an endless game, put on some music, and start stacking while all your troubles and anxiety fade into the background. Tetris's rotation system is broken. And you know what? I unabashedly love it. Warts and all.